This is the Investor Connect podcast program. I'm Hall T. Martin. I'm the host of the show in which we interview angel investors, venture capital, family offices, private equity, and many other investors for early stage and growth companies. I hope you enjoy this episode. Well, hello, this is Hall Martin with Investor Connect. Today, we're here with Ben Marins, partner at DECO. DECO designs your presentations to ensure investors and or customers see the most important information up front and remain engaged. Ben, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure. It's really great to be here, Hal. Thanks for inviting me. So what was your background before working with pitch decks in early stage companies? Well, if we dial it back all the way to high school, my background is in entrepreneurship in the sense that I was selling chicken sandwiches to my entire high school to make a quick buck. So I like to say that I was the only dealer in the school who was doing it legally. So I kind of got the the feel for for entrepreneurship early on. And when I say chicken sandwiches, I mean, I was moving it from my town all the way to my high school in Manhattan. And it's something that really gave me a lot of excitement in entrepreneurship and sales and working with people. And I ended up making a pretty penny at that time, interestingly enough. When I got to college, I had an interesting passing, a traumatic passing in in the family. And I decided it was time to get back on that entrepreneurial train as it was an amazing outlet for me. And I created a company called TabU, which was a mobile payment application for bar and nightlife customers, which integrated to the point of sale systems through a cloud-based API that we built out. And eventually, after about 10,000 users, I moved on from that. But it really taught me what it meant to go out and build a business, raise capital as as we did a venture, a seed round, and actually try and get customers. And what ended up happening is from that, I I spent some time at Bowery Capital as a uh, part-time analyst and and really seeing more and more B2B SaaS companies and understanding the model there. And after that, I went to a company called Medidata where I focus on healthcare SaaS for clinical trials. And I work with big pharma and biotech companies across the country. And interestingly enough, at the beginning of COVID, that's really when I started investing in early stage companies, which is a story in and of itself. Great. Well, so what excites you right now? Well, many things excite me, but in terms of sectors and what areas of business, I think, are going to grow or have significant challenges. One thing that I've noticed is that as we're going more and more remote, and this was a problem beforehand, training software is really, really antiquated and it's lacking. And I mean, corporate training on every level. We know what it's like when we get to a big company and they give us very outdated training. No one pays attention. And it ends up having a uh, tangible, measurable economic detriment to that company. And I think it's most prominent in the healthcare space. You're thinking about people who are in med school right now who are supposed to be dealing with cadavers and are now using software that's not really meant to parallel what it would be like to be in person. So I think in the healthcare ed tech space, that, that's one area. But a little bit more high level is I'm very interested in connected data platforms. So In almost every industry, we see an issue of, let's say, disconnection and and disparate systems that are not focused on bringing data together, and it's most prominent in healthcare. So, for example, why is a doctor putting in information to an EHR, an electronic health record, but that's not transmitted to another health system, and that's not transmitted to a psychiatrist that's working with that patient. And that's not transmitted to the pharmacy, right? So these are actually causing lives. And so I think one thing that's very exciting for me in this healthcare space is connected data systems. Like I know DataVant is going after that. And also education and training systems. And then just one more thing, because I feel like I could go on and on, micromobility and basically electric micromobility. So we know about Lyme and Bird, but I think there's a lot more opportunity there beyond those two companies that could really replace means of transportation on a day-to-day basis. Great. So you deal with pitch decks quite a bit. What should not be included in a pitch deck? Well, it's interesting you ask that because mostly everything you think that should be included in a pitch deck probably is not necessary. 
We all love Quentin Tarantino. He's one of my favorite directors. Django, one of the greatest movies. Leo Leonardo DiCaprio's character at one point says, gentlemen, you had my curiosity, but now you have my attention. And I think that that's what a pitch deck's supposed to do. It's supposed to get the curiosity from the investor. So whether that's an intro deck, a leave behind deck, or one where you're presenting over, you want to keep it streamlined. So more specifically, I think market size is a little bit unimportant, but market readiness is much, much better, right? You want to show that the market is big enough and ready for you to come in rather than just saying it's a big market. If you're building a software in the uh, rail sector, then telling that, telling everyone how big the rail sector is doesn't really help, but why is it good for your software is more important. And then there's the other piece that you don't want to focus too much on the problem. One of the things that I realized when I built Tabu, I was pitching to a very successful angel investor who invested in JetTalk.com very early. And he said at the end of the entire pitch, you guys spent 15 minutes talking about the problem. You're losing valuable attention up front. Attention is currency. So, you know, to sum it up, you want to have a pitch deck, garner and get curiosity from the investor. And then they are going to pay attention to you. You can't put everything in that pitch deck. So talk about the market readiness over the market size. And I would definitely limit your focus on the problem because the solution at the end of the day is what you're selling. Great. And so tell us more about what should be included in a pitch deck. Yeah, I think that's uh, it's a great follow-up question there, Al. So you've seen a lot of pitch decks and a lot of the time, I'm sure you would agree with this, is pitch decks don't capture a high level statement up front, right? I mean, you open up a pitch deck and it's telling you all this information that's not valuable at the beginning. And so I try to, as a a founder of Deco, when we work with startups that are raising money, they all have great ideas a lot of the time and great products even, but they're not looking at investors in a way where they should be educating them. They're trying to pitch them. And I don't think that's the right mentality. I think if you have a paradigm shift and you think about investors as students and you're educating them on your solution, on your company, it's much, much better. So in that regard, you want to start really high level and ease the investor in it. So stay far away from getting into detail. Stay far away from over overloading information. And I would focus on your North Star. So if you're a really early stage startup and you're even pre-product, but you have a great team, show your team up front. They're looking at that pitch deck really, really briefly. If you have a really good click-through rate or sell-through rate on an e-commerce platform, but your revenue is only $10,000, talk about your click-through rate. So really what you want to think about educating rather than pitching and finding that North Star metric that you could show. Great. Well, you've been in the startup industry for some time. How do you see this industry evolving and what changes do you see coming up? So Hal, when you say startup industry, can we we narrow that down a bit? Well, you deal with uh, companies that are raising funding and working with pitch decks, and there's quite a few different communities inside the startup world. Tell us about you know where you think the uh, the world is going these days. Yeah, so I'm I'm New York City based, and I think what we're seeing is a movement away from the epicenters of Silicon Valley and New York City, and even Austin and Tel Aviv, and and you're seeing Denver pick up, Salt Lake City pick up. I even have contacts out of New Mexico now, the Midwest, and all these different areas that are building out these ecosystems of startups through accelerators. And I think we're going to tap into some really great ideas that people who are operating in these much bigger urban environments like New York, Silicon Valley are not realizing. So from a geographical point of view, I think we're going to see a migration outside of New York, Silicon Valley, and even Austin and more to these mid-sized cities across the country. But from a technology perspective, I think that obviously SaaS is going to grow. But one thing I would really want to focus on is, is electric vehicles right now. It's so important to move in that direction. And in these urban environments, getting around is becoming increasingly difficult. There's a huge aversion to crowded spaces like subways. People don't want to get into Ubers. So what I see happening there is somebody, some company, or maybe a few are going to create a 
multi-vehicle electric mobility company. So whether that's Revel through their mopeds and then they go into another space or Teslas that are ride sharing, driving around. I mean, it, it's hard to know, but at least in that space, I see a lot more electricity going. But if there's a pointed question on where do I see the startup space going, I can answer that. Although it is popping into my mind from a venture capital perspective, I think one thing is interesting. We all know that volume of, of dollars are going up, right? In terms of investment. However, that's all happening at post revenue companies. It's less seed stage. I personally believe in this retail investing revolution with, with Robinhood, et cetera. We're going to see the accredited investor sort of become less prominent and, and give way maybe 15 years from now, maybe longer legally to a retail investor to invest at an early stage. And therefore, we're going to have more angel investing and early stage investing. What do you think about crowdfunding? You think that's going to overtake VC funding because of its size? Or do you think VCs will always be on top because they just keep raising bigger funds? That's a good question. I think VCs have the number one most important piece that nobody else has. And it's not money. It's access. I think one of the things I've learned as I've gotten into the angel investing scenario and worked with investors and, and have become a scout at different VC firms is the access to really good startup venture capital deals is so, it's exceptionally exclusive. And when they get access, they don't like to share too much. So I think crowdfunding will only grow as long as we have the models of our crowd and seed invest where there's a syndicate, you know, our crowd or any VC says, I'm going to invest $10 million. That's the allocation. Now I'm going to go raise it through a crowdfunding from accredited investors. I think we'll see that more. But there is that, I think, I, I'm hoping at least that there's going to be a little more of a, more of a democratization of venture capital, because I do think the accredited investor concept is not actually so protective over retail investors. Instead, it, it concentrates capital to the wealthy and continues to create that wealth disparity. So I'm hoping that changes along some period of time. Great. And so what is your investment thesis for startups? You know, it's nothing too astounding, but I think there's a magic sauce and, and, and you know it when you see it. Again, you know, I haven't been investing long enough to have a track record that could back up what I'm saying. So for those listening, take it with a grain of salt. But I do think it helps when you know your customer and know the industry better than anybody else. So for example, you know, I've invested in a B2B software that is in the music licensing space, right? And the guy who is running it has experience in that field and his legacy connections and his partner's legacy connections with other labels in the music space are exceptional, right? So I see that as a super defensible moat. And I also see the solution, obviously, is something that's going to be very valuable. And their ability to get people to buy it, to use it, is what is, is exceptional. So if you understand your customer, understand your market, obviously, the solution has to check off. And that's more of an intuitive thing and maybe some market research. And then third is being able to penetrate a market. So for example, I started Deco. It's not a scalable, massive business. But right away, we're getting startup clients through the roof. So I've proven I know how to get into the startup space. So being able to identify somebody who knows how to get into the space that they're targeting is super, super important because, you know, Peter Thiel talks about it. You're not going to have a great product sell itself, but you could have a bad product with a great salesperson become successful. Are there any startups that you can point to that match your thesis? Yeah. So one of them is SongClip. I think SongClip is going to be massively successful. They have, I think, the largest library of licensed song snippets, and, and, and it can be interspersed and, and connected to various media. So, you know, on Instagram, if you do a story, you could use Spotify, and it's a little bit clunky. So pretty much every content creation, maybe video games, whatever it is, could use SongClip, right? I think that that's, that's very powerful. But then like switching gears from a, from a technology type of company, we moved to a consumer packaged goods company. And there's this one family run company, the family's from South Africa, but they're based in Virginia that has created a built-on company, which is basically the equivalent of, of, of beef jerky, but a lot healthier, 
and a lot better. And it's air drive. And I think that they're matching something that's really incredible. It's healthy and it's delicious. And they know who their buyer is. So when I asked who is your buyer, he really understood it. He understood how he's going to get connected to it. And he didn't need a pretty penny to do so. And then I would say, because I spoke about mobility, there, there are some companies that really understand how they could get local municipalities, the governments to agree to work with them and use their vehicles. We look at Lime, we look at Bird, and they really screwed that up, quite frankly, right? They kind of used brute force. It didn't, it's worked, but not tremendously. It's a lot of clutter. People aren't buying it as much. And so being able to understand your customer and knowing how to operate is so critical. And I'll take that even further. One of my, one of my cousins has created a drone company for military purposes, right? And he's selling to a, a foreign military where he's from. And it's a very different sales cycle, but he understands exactly how to operate within that environment. And therefore, he could probably use those to operate with other military and security companies. So understanding who you're working with is critical. Doesn't mean you have to be from that space, but it does mean that you have to be able to exemplify or at least convince me you have an understanding of who you're selling to. Well, you see a lot of startups and a lot of investors. What are the challenges you see startups facing to launch their business these days? I think a lot of startups are prematurely trying to raise. And on the flip side, a lot of startups are not raising enough. And it's interesting because we have companies coming to us and they're spending $10,000 on branding. They're spending $10,000 on, on Dex. They're spending money in all different ways. And I'm thinking, you're an entrepreneur. You got to go teach yourself how to do it. And you got to get out there and do it yourself. So you're spending all this money to try to raise. Go raise yourself. And maybe don't even raise, maybe go and buy and spend time building the business. But I think that what we see from that statement is a lot of multi-directional focus and therefore not enough unidimensional focus where you can specialize and operate on the business or operate on fundraising. And then on the flip side, so many companies are like modest about how much they want to raise. I want to raise 500,000. I want to raise a million, 2.2 million. The more you raise, take this with a grain of salt, but the more you raise, the more likely an investor is going to want to invest, usually, at least from my perspective, because you have a higher chance of succeeding. You're going to have more runway. You're going to have more gunpowder. More gunpowder means more ability to actually do damage and, and create a great company. So I think if you're going to raise, go out and raise, right? If you're, not, if you're going to just do a little bit, go make your business great before you do that. Go and build a business. Take out some of your own money. So I think you want to identify, are you one of those companies that doesn't need a raise yet? And if so, go focus on your business. But if you think you need to raise money, raise some serious capital and don't be afraid to go after it. Then on the other side of the table, what, what's the challenge you see investors struggling with when they are investing in startups? I think a lot of investors are missing great opportunities from the cold outreach that they get, right? I think there's a lot of diamonds in the rough. And I think, like I said, there's this lack of democratization of the venture capital and startup space. And so if you're not in it, then you're not getting enough attention. So, you know, things that you're doing, uh, 10 Capital, I think are really phenomenal. And I think investors are missing out on those. And so me as kind of this rogue angel investor who kind of operates in his own way and, you know, you know, doesn't have a tremendous amount of capital to deploy, but sort of likes to work with SPVs and as a scout is I'm building, I'm a salesperson by nature in terms of my strategy, right? So I'm thinking about building a funnel in so many directions. So they're coming in from LinkedIn. They're coming in from my partnerships with accelerators. They're coming in from Deco. They're coming in from going to demo days and connecting with people like you. And they're continuously developing. And I'm taking every single one of them seriously. Because at the end of the day, those, that was Airbnb, right? And so I think investors are thinking a lot inside the box. And they're thinking like finance guys. I think you got to start thinking a little bit more like an entrepreneur, although let's be safe and not throw capital at the wall and hope it sticks and grows, of course. So what kind of subsectors or applications do you think are good immediate opportunities for investors to pursue today? Subsectors or applications. So I think, you know, any type of software that's trying to connect the different healthcare data that has an edge, I think could be a really successful company. I think corporate training software especially medical training software. I'm really looking to find companies like that. I mean, 
According to some studies, medical error is the third leading cause of death in the United States. And so, you know, there's clearly an issue there and a, an appetite for it and, and digital health in general. So, but beyond that, I, I, I do think we're going to see some serious winners in the micromobility, urban micromobility sector. And investors really need to focus on that. Lyman Bird didn't do what some investors wanted them to do. And that's because they are not actually replacing means of transportation that go up to four miles that get you to work. Okay. But there is going to be a solution and a company that will do that. And, and that's going to do that with electric vehicles purely. So I think that that both micromobility and in the healthcare space with digital technology and also training software, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And then one more thing that's interesting is we talk a lot about cybersecurity and cybersecurity is hugely important, but what about privacy? Privacy is different. It's about the legality. It's about how you handle the connection between the user's identity and the data itself. And there's very strict laws that occur after you have a uh, breach incident. So what kind of software is there? What kind of companies are there that are helping taking that antiquated process of using counsel to figure out what you should do and then pay these billion dollar fines if you're Equifax or Yahoo? Where are we figuring out how to automate the privacy response? So those are just three things that I've been looking at recently is just, you know, healthcare training and, and connected data platforms, micromobility through electric vehicles in the urban environment, and then privacy data breach response. Great. Well, appreciate that insight. In the last few minutes that we have here, what else should we cover that we haven't? I, th- I think there's, there's one interesting company that I would like to speak about, and, and, and that's because I studied neuroscience and have a real passion for neuroscience. And, and actually, you know, I think you introduced me to that, that company, and they're called Optios. And, you know, I don't know what I can or can't say, but I do think there are these really incredible mechanisms to capture brain electrical waves, right? You know, the synapses, the, the, the neurological activity in your brain and then correlate that to specific types of decisions, and then use that to optimize decision-making. And so I think that that's a really exciting space in general. And then beyond that, our understanding of the brain is incredible. I mean, Biogen just had, uh, the FDA just said they're likely to approve their new Alzheimer drug, right? Which, which is absolutely incredible. You have Axon Therapeutics, which is building a very, very impactful, at least on their data so far in phase three, drug that's going to help with treatment resistant and major depressive disorder. So I think one thing that more and more people could access, and it's not as complicated as they think, and is going to be huge, and it's not as sci-fi and off in the future the way they think Neuralink is, is how do we, how do we hack the brain? And how do, we, how do we invest in companies that are going to take information that the brain is depositing naturally and make it and make us better? So that's something I think more and more people should should be speaking about. Not just because it's exciting, but I think there's actual business opportunity and social impact that could occur from that. Yeah, I've seen quite a few demonstrations where they're actually reading the P wave of the brain wave spectrum and then actually using it to control a remote control car. And it, uh, you know, actually see demonstrations where people can actually, with their mind, move a car forward and back by just locking in on certain brain signals. So it's here and now for sure. And so it's a good point you bring up is that Sounds like it's space age, but it's really here and now because they've been doing work on this for some time and starting to lock in on certain signals that you can actually do something with. Exactly. There, there's so much opportunity. The brain is, is our entire life. I mean, people talk a lot about soul, right? I mean, I don't really know how to define what a soul is, but I could define what the brain is and I can understand, you know, I have 80 billion neurons and I can understand what synapses are, neurotransmitters are. And how it works from getting your the electrical signals down the axon to the synaptic terminal and transmitting. But we can actually learn from that. This is not just classroom stuff. It, it, we can become better as a species. So I think what Musk, I'm a huge Tesla guy. As you can tell, I love electric vehicles. I've been investing in them for God knows how long. But I love what he's doing with Neuralink as well. And I think we want to see more companies like that, that, that are being driven by leading scientists. And it doesn't have to be so esoteric, right? Because it could have everyday practical implications eventually. Now, I know some people have an aversion to it because it's kind of like kind of frightening and I get that, but I think they're just gonna, that's just gonna slow down the development of society. 
So, and that comes back to the healthcare training. Like, how do we tap into how the brain's neural networks, map it, identify what makes us learn better instead of like these surveys that aren't actually accurate, make medical training so much more effective and make corporate training so much more effective and just literally save lives through that. It's a very macro solution, but I'm very, I'm very excited about anything that has to do with neuroscience and mapping how the brain operates and using that to make people better and healthier. That's great. Well, appreciate your sharing this with us today. How best for listeners to get back in touch with you? So you can email me at ben at getdeco.com. You can also text me. I'm one of those that, that likes to, to text pretty much all the time. Is it weird to put my number out here? I don't know. I'll do it anyways. 201-888-6160. And then on LinkedIn, it's Ben Marins. And one of the things I think that I'm building out as, as I continue to develop my career, firstly, is I have a day job where I sell software to the big to big pharma and those kind of companies. But this angel investing thing is starting to really develop and how I connect with different VC firms and, and people who want to and have the means to invest. So anyone who kind of wants to be in my network, I'm starting an email newsletter. I'm actually going to be starting a podcast of my own. So I may turn the tables and interview you. So we'll, we'll have to see how that goes. Who wants to be in that network and, and, and see how I operate and be introduced to companies I think are good and connect with my thesis. I would love to have those people be connected and be able to be ingrained in, in that ecosystem that I hope one day will actually become formidable and help great companies get exposure. It's all in the effort to democratize it. And so maybe I'll be able to accomplish that. So if you're out there and you want a pitch deck presentation or you're interested in investment or you just want to hear about my thoughts and I'll be sending those out, it's you know ben at getdeco.com and it's uh, Ben Marins on LinkedIn. So that's the way to do it. Great. Well, thank you for joining my show and I'm glad to join yours when you're ready. Just give me a shout and I want to thank you for joining us today and hope to have you back for a follow-up soon. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess we'll find out pretty quickly whether or not the renewable space is going to be a hot sector in the next four years or not. So we'll see who gets to 270 first. <laughs> there you go. Well, thanks so much for taking time. Thank you, Al. I appreciate it a lot. And it's, oh, it was great speaking with you. Investor Connect helps investors interested in startup funding. In this podcast series, experienced investors share their experience and advice. You can learn more at InvestorConnect.org. Alti Martin is the director of Investor Connect, which is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to the education of investors for early stage funding. All opinions expressed by Hall and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinions of Investor Connect. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for the basis of investment decisions.